What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. Two quick announcements before we dive in. One, I'm doing a one-day sale on all my courses, 30% off. Starts right now and will end uh, middle of the day tomorrow, February 16th. So get it while it's hot, 30% off of that. Uh, announcement number two is there won't be a Swift News episode next week. I'll be out of town, won't be able to film. No big deal. And then as always, all the links for everything you see here will be in the GitHub repo. And if you find anything throughout the week, tweet it out with hashtag Swift News. I check that out before I build the show. All right, let's throw up the rundown and get into it. First up, I have an article from Antoine Vanderlee here on result builders, right? This is new in Swift 5.4. I featured like an overall what's new in Swift 5.4 from Paul Hudson last week, but we're gonna dive into a couple topics uh, this week. First one here is result builders, and they used to be known as function builders, and you've probably used these a little bit if you've been using Swift UI. Uh, you know, like what are result builders? Essentially, they uh, embedded DSL for collecting parts uh, that get combined into a final result. Again, if you've uh, you Swift UI, you'll be familiar. Var body sum view. Again, very common in Swift UI. Essentially what that means within the scope of this variable called body, it's going to return a single view and it builds views, right? Like it's gonna return this one VStack, but within this VStack, you could have multiple text or another VStack or an H stack, right? You know, Swift UI views can get kind of crazy, but the point is at the end of the day, it all builds to one view and that's this root level VStack, which again, as you can see in the var body, some view. So high, high level. That's what the result builder is doing. It's building all these views into one you know, return value. So check out the article to learn more about result builders. And Antoine does take it a step further, talking about creating your own uh, custom result builder. Walks through an example with uh, auto layout code, as you can see here. I'm just gonna scroll quickly because it is quite in depth. Uh, just to give you an idea of like how, how long it is, um, but talks about, you know, handling unwrapping of optionals, uh, handling conditional statements, right? So anyway, if you wanna do a deep dive into result builders, check out Antoine's article. Sticking with the theme of new stuff in Swift 5.4, we have Swift by Sundell here, chained implicit member expressions, again, new in Swift 5.4. And on the surface, as I'm just learning about it, this seems like a nice uh, you know, way to clean up your code a little bit. So essentially, the compiler will know when you're using dot syntax, like what you're referring to, right? So for example, we used to have to do view dot background color, UI color dot blue with alpha. Now you'll be able to do just you know dot blue, right? Or same thing when you create your own colors, right? Dot chili red with alpha component. So, Small little little cleanup here, but he does talk about how you can use this with your own APIs and how it really empowers that. And an example he uses here, like I, I love the way this reads. All right, so he has a constant called filtered and it's image dot with filter dot dramatic dot combined with dot invert, right? It kind of reads very well, right? Image with filter, dramatic combined with invert. So that's just an example of how readable this can be. And uh, I'm looking forward to really diving into this and experimenting with it. Next up, I have an article from Saren, uh, Navigation in Swift UI. Uh, this is part four in a series, you know, building lists and navigation in Swift UI goes really, really in depth. You can even see like the table of contents uh, here on the left. So of course you start off with, you know, what is navigation? And again, I like this article because it's very visual. You're gonna get a lot of screenshots and GIFs along the way kind of explaining things. But uh, again, I won't dive into detail. This is a very long in-depth article, but like you can see, here's an example of the GIF in action. But uh, this goes well beyond just the basic, here's how to use a navigation view in Swift UI, right? You get into all kind of the, the nitty gritty details of it. So if you wanna learn more about navigation, navigation view in Swift UI, check it out. And then if you want to, you know, go further into previous of these articles, right? Content view, scroll view, list view. There you go. It's right here. Up next, I have an article from Paul Salt, uh, 181 iOS developer uh, and productivity tools for beginners. So essentially what this is, is just a list of stuff Paul uses day to day. And you know, of course you're not gonna use all 181 of them, uh, but here's like, uh, you know, some quick links, right? If we go to iOS design tools, sketch, icon kit, icon set creator, Photoshop, Illustrator. So what I like about this is I can just kind of like scroll through this list. And if there's something I haven't heard of or something I'm interested in, like, you know, things, oh, obviously that's a pretty popular to-do app. You can click in do it and, and figure it out. So if you're looking for ideas on, you know, an iOS developer's workflow, and that goes for everything, right? Terminal tools, right? Git flow, homebrew, all that stuff. But he even gets into like what Apple adapters he uses, what office, right? Home office, you know, what kind of mouse monitor, all that stuff. So if you're interested in a, in a developer's workflow and you just kind of want to poke around and, and research here, this is a great spot. 
Moving on to the Twitter wisdom portion of the show, and I got a couple of these uh, this episode, uh, so I'll kind of move through them quick because I don't want to spend too long on every thread. But uh, John here says, uh, a programmer trap is something that feels productive, but in practice adds very little value to a project. Uh, refactoring can easily become a programmer trap. So there's some nuance here, right? John is not saying that refactoring is a programmer trap, never refactor. Of course not, that's silly. But, uh, you know, there are some times, and I know I've been there, and if you think about it, you've probably been there too, where you're kind of taking refactoring a little too far, and like, are you really adding anything to the project? Like, is this the best thing you could be doing right now? So again, there's nuance to this. This is not absolute. Um, but the point I wanna share, and I'll share some more examples, is that, you know, when you're working, maybe kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Like, is this a programmer trap? Like, is this the best thing I could be doing? Is this truly adding value to the project? Kind of keep that always in the back of your mind. So let's walk through like a, just a couple of different examples, right? Creating the perfect abstraction is a programmer trap. Most of the time you should just solve the problem in front of you. Only occasionally is a full abstraction necessary. Um, we'll just finish with this one. Chasing the latest trends can be a programmer trap. Hot new frameworks, library that solves a problem you don't really need, uh, then don't use it, right? You can waste a lot of time, you know, quote unquote, evaluating a cool new trend. So again, just keep that voice in the back of your head. Is this really adding value to the project? Is this the best thing I could be doing right now? I think that will be helpful to not fall into these programmer traps. All right, next up, we have Oscar here with let's debunk some myths about Swift UI, right? So the first myth, uh, it's buggy and consumes a ton of resources. And he says, 99% of the time, this boils down to programmer error uh, when it comes to state observation, right? Using SwiftUI efficiently is all about mastering state, observed object, environment, and combined. Um, it's kind of what I said about my course, right? The most difficult thing in SwiftUI is not making a screen look pretty or building pretty animations. Like to me, that's kind of easy. Managing the flow of your data, that's where things get difficult. So I kind of uh, agree with him. So, you know, maybe 99% of the time it being programmer error might be a bit much, um, but I think the point is that like, uh, there's a lot of blaming it on the framework when oftentimes it's, it's programmer error. Uh, and then another one I want to point out here is it lacks functionality from UI kit app kit. And this, this kind of changed my perspective a little bit, or I don't know, made me think about it differently might be the better way to put it. Um, so it doesn't lack the functionality. It builds upon it. You're one view representable away from, you know, UI kit land or app kit land. Apple won't and doesn't need to rebuild it all in Swift UI. Pull in a legacy view where you need to and carry on. This is a feature, not a compromise. Use it. So I'll, I'll admit, I kind of looked at this view, UI view representable and all that stuff, kind of like Objective-C bridging headers when Swift first came out. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're working on a legacy app, I'm sure you use bridging headers all the time. I have not touched a bridging header in like four years because all my projects have just all, all been in Swift. So that's kind of how I thought UI view representable and all this stuff would be. It would be what we needed during the transition, but eventually, you know, I kind of thought Apple would rebuild everything. But hearing Oscar say this, of course, I don't know what Apple's gonna do, who knows. But it does make sense. They don't have to, right? That functionality is already built and you just got to drop down to UIV representable. So this maybe swayed my opinion on UIV representable and using that only being a temporary thing. I think he might be onto something that, you know, this may be a, a feature, not a compromise. And the final piece of Twitter wisdom here is from Chris Hurd, who's uh, big in the remote workspace, but he says, I've spoken to 2000 plus companies over the last 12 months about their plans for remote work going forward. Here are a few things I've learned. And it's a, it's a big long thread. So I'm going to point out a couple of them, but I wanted to share it uh, in case you're curious about maybe the direction remote work is going. Again, this is not like a scientific study. This is not hundred percent going to happen, but this is just, you know, a, a data point and what like he's hearing. All right, so HQs are finished. Companies will cut their commercial office space by 50 to 70%. I think we're already like seeing that. And they see fully distributed, about 30% of the companies are getting rid of the office entirely and going 100% remote. Obviously the access to talent, that was pretty, pretty obvious there. Um, remote burnout, I thought this was interesting, right? Because the productivity is going up, but you know, people might be working harder as, as weird as that sounds. Cause if you've worked in an office, you know how it is, right? Like how much work are you actually doing in the office, right? Hey, let, let's go grab lunch or Hey, pull, you get pulled into a meeting or, or just coworkers coming to, to bullshit with you. Like the work day is pretty broken up when you're actually in an office, when you're at home, maybe that goes away a little bit. So anyway, I wanted to share this. If you're interested in remote work, I'm scrolling through it pretty quickly. There's a really, really long thread on some just interesting thoughts regarding remote work in the future. Next up, I wanted to share an article from Leroy here, Road to My First iOS Job. And I know I just featured an article similar to this last week, but I want to point, I mean, you can read his story, hear it, but the, the main takeaway I want to share here is kind of towards the bottom. And that's like the process he went through, right? The stats, because I think a lot of people uh, searching for jobs that haven't done this before, they kind of have the wrong expectations, right? So here's what he did, right? He applied to 286 
positions total, right? And you see 219 were iOS developers. You can see the breakdown there. You can see like 188 of them were through LinkedIn, Stack Overflow. You can see like how he got them, uh, where he applied, mostly through Europe, a few in the United States. Um, but here's the results, right? Here's, we know this is really what you're here for. Yeah, you nailed it. So, and this is the whole point, right? He sent out 286 applications and he got 74 rejections. So about 75% of companies didn't even respond. And of the 74 rejections, 58 of those were just the typical automated response, no, no feedback whatsoever. On the positive side, he got 15 interviews, five take-home projects, and he rejected two companies because, you know, it, you know, whatever, it didn't work out. But the point is, 15 interviews out of 286 applications. That's the main point because I talk to a lot of people that are, are trying to, you know, they want help getting their first job and they've only applied to seven companies. It's like, that's not how this game works. It is a numbers game. It's as sad as that is. It definitely is. And this is very common. I... I didn't go to this extreme. It took me 60 applications to get my first job, but of the 60 applications I sent out, I got three interviews, right? So it's, that's the whole point is it takes time, expect to get rejected. If you can't let the rejection get to you trying to get that first job because you're gonna get rejected way more than you're not. And again, I just wanna point this out, illustrate this, that uh, if you're new, you're trying to get your first job and you've only applied to a small handful of companies, Maybe it'll work out. I'm not going to say it's not going to, but that's not typically how it goes. Moving on to AR Corner, you may have already seen this by now, but uh, this kind of went a little bit viral here within the iOS space. But yeah, this is pretty cool for augmented reality and like Apple glasses, right? You get the screens that just extend from side to side here. Uh, this is like a really, really cool use case, right? Because like everything is like a huge desktop. Maybe everything's an ultra wide monitor, you know? So really curious uh, to see if this plays out or how it plays out. Um, I think extending your desktop is a great use case. And then finally, I just wanna share two random things with you. Nothing to do with iOS development, but this GIF on like sorting algorithms was just mesmerizing. Like I was just sitting here like staring at it for like 10 minutes. So yeah, it was just, uh, it was crazy. So I wanted to share that kind of random. I'll let it play real, real quick right here again. Yeah, it's just, I was just watching it over and over again. I won't do that here. You're, that'll bore you. Anyway, and the next random thing here is uh, from the Unreal Engine, right? They released MetaHumans. Maybe you've seen this, but this is like ridiculous, right? So this is like the level of fidelity we're at with like graphics and like the Unreal Engine. Like, and that may look cool. Like, yeah, yeah, we see that all the time in movies, but like you can like customize it. Like here's like the customization engine, like the wrinkles, the every little bit about the face and it's insanely customizable and then looks at like that high fidelity. I mean, like uh, it's, it's, it's insane. It's crazy, mind blown. All right, hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll see you in the next one.